It's good to be in the Lord's house, amen. My dad was an old Pentecostal preacher, and he used to say often on a Sunday morning, I'd rather be here than the best hospital in town. And I thought that, that I'd rather be here today than the best hospital in Roanoke or Salem. This is the best place to be this morning is in the house of God. And we are so glad to have you with us. We are beginning a new sermon series today simply entitled Prayer. And I didn't want to tag anything along with that. just want to call it Prayer. And I'm going to talk about what could happen and what would happen if we pray. And then over the next several weeks, I'm going to talk about those things that can happen in our lives and the promises that are contained within the Word of God, especially the New Testament when it comes to prayer. One Sunday in September, we're going to uh, talk about praying for the sick, and then we're going to uh, do what we would call in the old church days, an old-fashioned healing line or prayer line, and we're going to do what the Bible tells us to do and teaches us to do, call for the elders of the church, the leaders of the church, the ministers of the church to come to anoint with oil, to lay hands on you, and to pray a prayer of faith over you. And so we're going to do that on the Sunday in September. We're going to anoint you with oil, as the Scripture tells us to, and then we're going to pray prayers of faith over you as well. Let me say up front at the beginning of this series that I do not want to add more guilt to your life as we talk about prayer today or over the next several weeks at all. Um, almost everyone I know, from pastors to church members who sit in the seats every Sunday morning, feel slightly guilty about their prayer life in the sense that they do not pray enough or spend enough time in prayer. And I know there are folks that, that spend a lot of time in prayer, and some don't have any guilt about that at all. But most people I talk to over the years have a sense of guilt that they do not spend enough time in prayer and talking to God. And so I don't want to add to your guilt. I don't want to add to that burden that you may carry about that. And in fact, my goal throughout this series is to increase your joy by showing you the boundless possibilities of prayer and what prayer can do and how it can help your life as a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's begin by jumping into this, and I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning which I think are crucial for us to try to answer as we go throughout this, this series that we're going to be talking about. First, the question is, what kind of church does Christ want Harvest Ministries to be? What kind of church does Christ want this church, Harvest Ministries, to be? And the second question you see is, what would happen in Harvest Ministries if someone prayed for each person every day? What would happen in this church if someone prayed for each person every day? I think those are two excellent questions for us to reflect on because most of us here today and those watching believe in prayer, don't we? Yes. Even if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, there is something in many people who believe in prayer. Maybe you know someone who doesn't go to church and they would say to you, would you pray for me? Could you have your church pray for me? Could you ask your parents or your grandparents to pray for me? Although they don't really get involved in that themselves, they believe there is something about prayer and talking to God. And so even if we do not pray much, even in our own lives, we still believe in prayer. So what would happen in this church if every day each person were prayed for by someone? Or what would it do to our worship? What would it do to our preaching or to our ministries? How would it affect our outreach and our evangelism? How would it affect our relationships if each day someone prayed for every person in this church? If that were to begin to happen, this church could not be the same. I dare say this church would not be the same if we made sure every person was prayed for by someone every day. What if we started to look uh, to pray like that? What would that begin to look like in the life of Harvest Ministries? And I want you to kind of hold on to that thought, and we're going to come back to it here in just a few minutes. In the meantime, I want to look in Ephesians chapter 6 at what the Apostle Paul had on his mind and what he was trying to share with the believers in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle is ending the end of this letter. He's getting near the end of this letter, and he is calling for Christians to put on the whole armor of God. And many of you no doubt know the, the story, the whole armor of God. He tells us to put on this armor so that we can not only fight 
spiritual battles every day, but so that we can win spiritual battles every day. Can I just say this? As believers in Jesus Christ, I'm tired of simply fighting spiritual battles every day, and I want to begin winning spiritual battles every day. So I don't know if you just fight the battles. Why don't we win these battles that we're fighting? Why don't we get the victory over temptation and over sickness and over disease and over whatever it is? Let's not just fight those battles. Let's begin winning these battles that we're fighting. And then without a break, after talking about the armor of God, he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Now, if this were a Bible school class we were teaching, we would say this is prayer 101. And this is the how to pray Paul is talking about here, not the why to pray. And we all know the why to pray. We got problems, we got issues, we don't have enough money, the kids are sick, the kids have lost their minds, my wife's mad at me, my, my husband's mad at me. That's the why to pray. We know what the why is, but Paul is talking about the how to pray. Not just the why behind it, but this is how I want you to pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions and pray with all kinds of prayers and requests. And there is nothing difficult about what Paul is telling us in Ephesians chapter 6. In fact, it's very simplistic, which makes it easy for me to understand what he's trying to tell me. And as we put what Paul is saying into context in Ephesians chapter 6, we realize that prayer is our ultimate weapon in spiritual warfare. Prayer is not part of the armor that he lists in Ephesians chapter 6. Prayer is what makes the armor effective in Ephesians chapter 6. So prayer is not the weapon he's talking about. Prayer is what makes the weapons effective. It's what makes my breastplate of righteousness effective. It's what having my feet shod effective. It what makes my shield effective. It makes the word effective. Prayer makes these things effective and powerful in our lives. And so then Paul begins to give us some facts about Christian prayer. And so I want to look at some of the, the facts he gives us. In fact, there's five things I want to talk about this morning. The first fact is there are many ways I can pray. It's not just one way to pray. There are many ways that I can pray. That's why Paul tells us in that passage, pray with all kinds of prayers and requests. And so as we analyze prayer, we see that there are many different angles when it comes to prayer. And I've got some listed for you this morning that you can write down if you'd like to. First is the content of our prayers. What is that? That is perhaps our adoration of God when we pray. It is our thanksgiving when we pray. It is our meditation before God. It is our confession or our petition. That is the content of our prayer. This is what we are doing in our prayer time. We this morning have worshiped God. We have adored God. We have praised God. That is part of our content this morning. And so there are many different parts of our content. Then we can talk about the posture of our prayer. We can pray sitting. We can pray standing. We can pray with our hands lifted. We can pray with our eyes open. We can pray with our eyes closed. We can pray while we walk, or we can pray when we kneel. We can pray as we stretch out on the floor before God. There are all kinds of postures that we can assume when we are praying. And then we talk about the associations of our prayer. And what does that mean? That means that we can pray alone, or we can pray in a small group, or we can pray during a worship service, or we can pray in a concert of prayer all at one time together. It means that we can pray over the internet. In case you don't know this, that while this service is going on, people will send prayer requests to us all throughout this service, and we will respond back to them, and we will pray for them over the internet even while our service is going on here at Harvest Ministries. You can pray over the internet. You can pray over the phone. You can pray over an email. You can even pray over a handwritten note that you send to somebody. Those are all the associations of prayer. Let me talk about the style of our prayer. It could be a formal prayer. It could be an informal prayer. 
It could be liturgical. It could be written. It could be recited. It could be a conversational prayer. It could be a thank you, Jesus prayer. You ever prayed those before? Or how about a Lord have mercy prayer? How many ever prayed that prayer before? A Lord have mercy prayer. Maybe it's a short prayer. Maybe it's a long prayer. Maybe it's a prayer that you sing to God. Maybe it's a prayer that you're speaking. Maybe it's a prayer that has been written or a prayer that is chanted or a prayer offered spontaneously or even a prayer that has been memorized. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. A prayer that's been memorized. All kinds of styles of prayers, and none of them are wrong because Paul says, I want you to pray in all kinds of prayers and all kinds of requests. Then we talk about the places of our prayer. We could pray in the morning. You could pray during your devotion time each day. You can pray around your dinner table. You can pray in your car. You can pray on your phone. You can pray during a worship service. You can pray while you're in the street. Or you can even pray at a ball game. It doesn't matter where you're at. You can pray anytime, anywhere. The place doesn't matter where you're praying. Finally, we can talk about the objects of our prayer. What is the object that I'm praying about? Could be confession, could be restoration. Could be for a physical need or a spiritual need or an emotional healing. It could be for a financial need or it could be for a broken relationship to be healed. It could be for salvation. It could be for spiritual growth. It could be for the spread of the gospel. The object of my prayer may be a friend or for the leaders of the church. Or an object of the prayer could even be an enemy of mine who is out to hurt me and out to destroy me. Prayer can be as different as the need of the heart is at that moment. See, the true measure of prayer is not its form or content or its style or location or its length or its beauty. When it comes to prayer, the real question is simply this. Does it come from the heart? Is it sincere? And am I truly seeking God in this prayer? So first, Paul tells us there are many ways that I can pray. And if we pray prayers that come from the heart and that are truly seeking God, then we can claim the promise of James chapter 5, verse 16, that states the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If you are praying truly seeking the heart of God and your prayer is coming from your heart to, to God's heart, then you can claim that promise that it will be a powerful and an effective prayer because it is coming from my heart in Jesus' name, and the Father is pleased. And when the Father is pleased, he begins to incline his ear toward us to hear what his children are saying. How many has ever been upset with your child before or your children before? Yeah, a few honest parents in here, <laughs> grandparents. And their child has done something that you were not particularly fond of, and they will try to explain why. And you may have said to them, or they may say to them even now, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. What have you done? You've, you've turned your ear away from them. But when we talk to God from our heart in sincerity, the Bible says he inclines, he turns his ear to us to hear what it is his children are saying to him. And if that happens, now we can pray a powerful and an effective prayer. So first, there are many ways I can pray. Secondly, the best time to pray is when I feel the need to pray. That's a pretty simple explanation, I believe. In fact, Paul instructs us to pray on all occasions. That Greek wording and phrasing on all occasions used here in Ephesians chapter 6 means a particular moment in life when you feel the need for God. That's what that means. Pray on all occasions. It is a moment in time in my life when I feel the need for God. It is the idea of coming to a crossroads in life or a time of need in your life and sensing your own weakness and then crying out to God, saying, God, I can't handle this. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I am sensing my own weakness, and now, God, I need your help. And sadly, even as Christians and people who believe in Jesus Christ, we only think that we should pray about the big things in life and not bother God with the small stuff. But that is some foolish thinking from the people of God. 
because he is God. He is the God of the universe. He speaks and things come into existence that did not exist before. He speaks and things change and things get rearranged and get ordered again like they should be. And to God, all of my stuff is small stuff because he's God. It's all small stuff to him. I don't have any big stuff of God. It's just small stuff. Now, we have big stuff, and we talk about what we have going on, and we talk about what's wrong, and we talk about what's happened, and we talk about how bad it is, and yet to God, it is all small stuff. And so if it is all small stuff to God, why shouldn't I take my small stuff to God and let my big God help me with my small stuff? Does that make any sense? God, I'm bringing you my big stuff that's big to me because I know it's small to you, and I'm going to let you help me with my small stuff in my life. Maybe we should say it this way, that because God cares so much for us, even our small stuff matters to him. Some of you have experienced your child or children growing up and moving out of the home. Maybe they've gotten married. Maybe they've gone off to college somewhere. Maybe they just moved out on their own. And as tends to be the case, especially with guys, we don't call home as often as we should. We don't check in as much as we should with our parents. But when you get that phone call, you haven't heard from your child in quite a while. How does that make you feel? It makes you feel good, doesn't it? Or you get a text or you get a FaceTime call. Or they send you an instant message of some sort and you think, they took the time to reach out to me and it makes you feel good. I just want to tell you this morning that God is glad when his children reach out to him. God is glad when his children talk to him. God is glad when his children pray to him. In fact, God is waiting for you to talk to him and to cry out to him in prayer. So there are many ways I can pray. Secondly, the best time to pray is when I feel the need to pray. Thirdly, I must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when I pray. Paul says that we are to pray in the Spirit. Now, what does that mean to pray in the Spirit? Well, we are Pentecostal, and some of you are charismatic. You came into, out of that church or out of that tradition. Maybe some of you knew the Pentecostalism or charismatic. That's fine. We believe that we can pray in the Spirit with unknown tongues. We believe the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us, and he speaks a language through us that we don't even understand what he's saying to us sometimes. And some call it their prayer language, and they pray in tongues, and and they speak in tongues, and they pray over others in tongues. And we could have a whole discussion about that at some point in time. But in this particular sense, when Paul says to pray in the Spirit, he is meaning to pray under the influence of the Spirit. It is as though the Holy Spirit covers us. And as he covers us, he is influencing every prayer that we pray. And we are beginning to pray following the Spirit's guidance and leading. As he leads us, we begin to pray. That's why sometimes when we have times of prayer around the altar, you will notice that some leaders and ministers, and myself included, sometimes we kind of stand back. It's not that we don't want to pray for people. It's just we're waiting to begin to pray under the leading or the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And many times the Holy Spirit will speak to you and guide you specifically to someone that you need to pray with. Because maybe you don't need to pray with or for everybody, but maybe there is one person in particular that the Holy Spirit wants you to pray for. And so as you are covered in the Spirit and begin to pray in the Spirit, he will begin to guide you to go to that person and begin to pray for them and pray with them. Holy Spirit not only invites us to pray, he encourages us to pray. Sometimes we may think to ourselves, I should pray about this or I should pray about that. Let me encourage you this morning to never brush that feeling aside. That when you think you should pray about something or you should pray about someone, go ahead and pray right then at that very moment. 
because the Holy Spirit is leading you and he is guiding you. If the Holy Spirit wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, pray for Steve Hodges, then you pray at 3 o'clock in the morning for Steve Hodges. Why? The Holy Spirit is guiding you. If he wakes you up at 2 o'clock and says, pray for Linda Carver, you say, at 2 o'clock, I'll pray for Linda Carver. Why? Because the Holy Spirit guided me to pray for her at that very moment, and I did it at an instant. I cannot tell you the number of times that people have told me Someone prayed at the exact moment they needed prayer, at the exact moment of weakness, the exact moment of tragedy, at the exact moment of a loss. Somebody prayed for them at that moment. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was leading and guiding them to pray at that moment. That impulse to pray may come at any time. You can pray while you're on the phone with somebody or talking with a friend. You may have an impulse to pray when you're listening to the radio or watching television. You may feel an impulse to pray while you're sitting in church or even while you have a sleepless night or even getting ready for surgery. If you think about praying, then go ahead and pray at that moment. And you don't have to pray out loud. In fact, you can pray to God just without speaking any words at all. And God will hear you from heaven, the words you're praying in your mind to him. And then pray about the things God places on your heart to pray about. Do not be ashamed or worried that you will say the wrong things in your prayer or that you may not say the right things. The Holy Spirit knows your heart. And that is what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What is Paul saying? He said there are going to be some times that you are prompted to pray, but you are not going to have the words to pray. You don't know what to say, and then you will just begin to groan in your spirit. You will have moanings and groanings, and yet God understands our moanings and our groanings. Why? Because he knows the very heart of his children. He understands that. Well, I don't believe that, Pastor Atkins. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. I got a grandson sitting over here with my son. We keep him a couple of days a week. He has cries and groans and moans. But I can tell you this much. I don't know his cries and groans and moans as well as his mom and dad know them. He can cry or moan and groan, and they will say, that's his hungry cry. And I'm like, I don't think so. Yeah, Dad, that's his hungry cry. And sure enough, that's his hungry cry. Or he can moan and groan, and they can say, that might be his, he, he's, he's doing some business in his diaper groan right there, Dad. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that's, 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 that's the noise he makes when he does that. Now, how do they know that about him? Because they are his parents. And although we keep him from time to time, they are with him much more than we are. And they know him more intimately and personal than we even know him as his grandparents. And God, our heavenly father, hears our cries and he hears our groaning and he hears our moaning and he knows the voice of his children. And he says, I know exactly what they need right now. I know exactly what they're trying to say, but they can't put it in the words. I know my children. I know their hearts. I know their moanings and their groanings. And the Holy Spirit will come alongside of you. And in our feeble attempts to pray and talk to God sometimes, in our moanings and groanings, the Holy Spirit will take those things back to the Father for us. And the Father will hear what we're trying to say. I don't want to make this mysterious. Let me just say it as simple as I can. Whenever you feel an inner urge to pray, pray. That's all it is. Whenever there's something inside of you that says you need to pray, then you pray. I don't care what you're doing. You drop it and you start praying at that very moment. Here's fact number four about prayer. I must be alert when I pray. Paul tells us that, that we need to be alert. He says, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And I like how the message says it. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Paul uses a military term 
with that word alert. It's a military term that he's using there. Now let's suppose that there is a soldier who is stationed at a military base in Afghanistan next to a Taliban stronghold. Those do they, those, those still exist in that part of the world. So I've got a U.S. soldier stationed at a military base in Afghanistan who was on high alert because there is a Taliban stronghold near that base. And I'm going to compare that soldier to a security guard who works at Kroger down here on 460. Which one of those two do you think is going to be more alert or should be more alert? The security guard in Afghanistan next to a Taliban base or security guard at Kroger? Nothing wrong with security guard at Kroger. I have nothing against them. But I'm just trying to get my mind around which one should be more alert. It better be that one at military base next to the Taliban stronghold. He ought to be more alert. And that is what Paul is saying to us. That soldier is on the front lines. And that soldier is going to be more alert. And the problem is, Paul was trying to say, and this is why I use that military term, as Christians many times, as, as believers in Jesus Christ, we compare ourselves with the security guard at Kroger more than we do to the soldier in Afghanistan. And yet, we are on the front lines of a spiritual battle for our very souls. And we act like we're a bunch of security guards guarding bananas and apples and fruit in the grocery store. And Paul says, you are the children of God. Be on high alert. The enemy wants to destroy you. Listen, you can, you can drag in and drag out of here, but the enemy will destroy you every time. You can pray only when you come to church on Sunday mornings and never pray for the rest of the week. An enemy will be at your door day after day after day after day, and you will fight spiritual battle after spiritual battle, and you'll never win one of them. Why not start winning the spiritual battles in your life? I am a soldier in the army of the Lord. I will be alert at all times. Time to get alert. Why do I need to be alert? Because my... Brothers and sisters are dependent on me. This is a life and death matter. This is an eternal matter. So many of us mess around with prayer because we do not think prayer matters. But the reality is we are the soldier on the front line in spiritual combat. Amen. And yet, have you noticed how distracted we become during prayer time? Just as you bow your head, your phone rings. Just as you start to pray, you get five texts in a row. Some music starts playing randomly from somewhere. You get distracted. You forget you put dinner in the oven and you forgot to check it an hour ago. And a thousand other things come crowded into your mind whenever you began to pray. Seems like the devil does some of his best work when we decide to pray and begins to unload his entire arsenal against us. Maybe you're one of those people who so I'm going to spend an hour in prayer. You pray for yourself. You pray for your family members. You pray for your church leaders. You pray for the missionaries that you know. You pray for every missionary in the world and every country in the world. You pray for everything you can think of to pray for during that time. And you open up your eyes and look at your watch or your clock and realize I've only prayed for 10 minutes. And yet I've committed to pray for an hour. I have prayed for everything I know to pray for. In that time frame. Why? Because we get so distracted and so off track. And our minds go every which direction, even when we're trying to pray. Now, I, you know, listen, I'm not against technology. I'm using a boatload of it up here this morning. But this is your biggest distraction right now when it comes to prayer time. This right here. You got to learn to put this thing away sometimes and just talk to God. And some of you don't have a problem with that. You're not from a whole different generation. I get that. You can take yours off the hook still. But the rest of us, 
We got these things everywhere we go. Everywhere we go, these things are there. And you can say, I'm not going to check it, and still we got to look at it. We got, just got to know what's going on. Got to make sure nobody got a hold of us. Nobody needed me for anything. And it's there. So mine stays right here on Sunday mornings when I preach, and it goes off all the time while I'm preaching. People text me while I'm preaching. Call me while I'm preaching. No, I'm in church. And still, that phone goes off. It's just the way of the world. I know we live in a different world nowadays. But you need to put your distractions aside. You can't pray and watch television. You can't pray with all the distractions going on. You can't pray and be typing 20 emails you got to send out to everybody. You can pray in your mind those things, but there comes a moment where you got to put everything aside and just get alone with God and shut every distraction out away from you. Someone asked me one time while we close our eyes and we pray in church, and the answer is simple. We don't have to close our eyes when we pray in church. We don't have to bow our heads. There's no power in that whatsoever. But all it does for me is to try to help you not get distracted. Because if you saw what I see when I say, let's pray up here, you could never pray. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm getting close to quitting time. I'm going to tell you this. When I say, let's get ready to pray, there, it's like the children of Israel leaving Egypt. It's an exodus in this place. <laughs> And that door's part open, and people depart. Now, I know it, it's a lot of us in here, but we can get you off the hill, and you get to the restaurant in plenty of time. They got plenty of food. All that's good today. But it's like, that's, that's the code word to leave. Let us pray. Now, none of y'all going to leave today because I got my own you, right? No, you'll still leave, and that's okay. We love you anyway. No, but when I pray i got to be alert. Fifthly, let me say this quickly. I need to broaden my circle of prayer. Paul instructs us to pray for all the Lord's people. That means I pull myself out of my rut of praying just for myself and just for my family. It is, it's legitimate. It, it is, we must pray for those closest to us. We must pray for ourselves. I must pray for my families. I must pray for my friends. But I have not exhausted the power of prayer if I stop there. If I only pray for myself and my family and my friends, I have not exhausted the power of prayer. And so on the screen, you see the concentric circles, and you think of prayer in those, those terms of concentric circles. We always start with those closest to us, don't we? I always pray for myself. Every day I pray for myself, and hopefully you do. And I always pray for my family, and I always pray for my friends who are really close to me. I always pray for them. And if I stop there, I'm not exhausted all the power of prayer. I've just got a little bit of this power. But as I begin to pray, I begin to broaden that circle of my prayer, and I move out from there. And so now I'm going to pray for Harvest Ministries, right? Because that's my church. So I'm going to pray for Harvest Ministries. And as I pray for Harvest Ministries, the Holy Spirit may say, now pray for another church. Pray for the Baptist church down the road. Pray for the Methodist church across the street. Pray for the Presbyterians. Pray for the Catholic church meeting today. And it begins to inspire me to pray for other churches. And so I pray for my inner circle. I begin to expand that. Pray for harvest. I pray for other churches. As I pray, I begin to pray for the missionaries that I know. I pray for Bishop Richard. I pray for Calvin. I pray for Kazi. These are all the guys that have been here that some of you know. I pray for all those missionaries that I know. But I don't stop there. Now I begin to pray for other countries, places I've never been to, places I may never go. But I begin to pray, pray for places like Indonesia, and I begin to pray for China, and I begin to move out and pray for those other countries like that. What am I doing? I am broadening the circle of my prayer. It's not just about me. It is about other people around me as well. So let me ask you today, how wide is your circle of prayer? I'm going to jump down to the next points this morning as I begin to wrap this up. And I'm going to give you two truths to take home. First truth is this. I will never outgrow the need for prayer. I'll never outgrow the need for prayer. Some of us find it hard to ask for prayer because we think it's a sign of weakness. And can I let you know a little secret this morning? It's not really a secret. Let me just tell you it anyway. When you ask for prayer, that is a sign of weakness, and that's okay. It proves you can't do it by yourself. 
It proves you're not strong enough, and you're not smart enough, and you're not good enough, and you're not capable enough to do whatever it is that needs to be done by yourself, and you need somebody to pray with you and for you. You are never so strong that you will ever be beyond the need of prayer. An old spiritual song says it this way, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That's me. Every day I stand in the need of prayer. Sometimes we don't ask for prayer because we're overly concerned about our image. Many times our pride keeps us from praying and asking for prayer in desperate moments. Sometimes we're afraid to come around the altar for prayer because we think someone will hear our prayers and find out what we're praying about. Listen, if someone hears what you're praying about and they love you, they're not judging you, they all, they'll just start praying with you and for you. I want people who love me enough to pray with me and pray for me. So I'll never outgrow the need for prayer. Lastly, I'll never outgrow the need to pray for others. Someone you know right now needs prayer. Everybody. Whether you, you claim to be a Christian, don't claim to be a Christian, faith, have faith, don't have faith, doesn't matter. Someone in your circle of influence needs prayer right now. Someone needs hope. They need patience. They need encouragement. They need courage, they need love, they need determination, they need insight, they need strength, or maybe they need some guidance in their life. Think of it in these terms today. Someone will be wounded unless you pray. Someone will give up unless you pray. Someone will be deceived unless you pray. Someone will yield the temptation unless you pray. Someone will make a foolish choice unless you pray. Someone will collapse under the burden they are carrying unless you pray. There's always more than enough to pray about if we'd only open our eyes and look around. Always something to pray about. So let me return to the question I posed earlier. What would happen in our church if everyone in this congregation prayed for someone every day? What would it do to our worship? What would it do to our outreach? What would it do for our relationships? What would it do for our faith and our vision for the future? What would it do for our leadership if they were prayed for every day? If we started praying for each other every day, we would not be the same and we could not be the same. Remember the words of Jesus when he said, my house will be called a house of prayer. Yes. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that were true in this church and in every other church as well? Think of the word that would spread about this church. Those people on that hillside really know how to pray. Think of how our love would grow. Think of the lives that would be changed. Think of the miracles that God would do. Think of the excitement we would have here on a Sunday morning if we all began to pray. We would get up early. We would come to church eager, waiting to see what God was going to do. If we start to pray, we'll sing with new enthusiasm. We'll pray with a new fervency, and we'll listen with a new expectation of what God wants to say to us. Think of the impact we can have around the world if we begin to pray. If we begin to pray for God's work in Indonesia and Africa and India and Haiti and China, just to name a few of the places, I think God has more for us than we've ever dreamed. But what if we really started to pray? Some sermons answer questions, but this one asks the question. And now it is your turn to consider the answer. Maybe this morning this has hit home with you. Maybe it's a wake-up call. Maybe you've known for a long time that your prayer life is not what it should be or what it used to be or what it needs to be. And you want to do something about that. For others of you here and watching, you are in serious need of prayer this morning. It may have to do with your health or your finances or your relationships or a decision you have to make or a career choice that you're going through. Whatever it is, you are in need of prayer today. Let me encourage you to not let your pride stand in the way. You be the one who says, Lord, I'm in the need of prayer this morning. For others of you, you know someone who needs prayer. That person has been on your heart. They've been on your mind. And as I have spoken this morning, the Holy Spirit has begun to bring them back before you again. And you're sensing an urging of the Spirit to pray for them this morning. What would happen if we really started to pray? Some of you are leaders in this congregation. Are you praying? Are you seeking God for direction in your ministry? 
Or are you simply going through the motions and filling a spot that needs to be filled? If you're a kid's worker, are you praying before you go to the lower level on Sunday mornings about the kids that you're going to minister to that day? Greeters and hospitality team, are you praying about the people who will walk through those doors on a Sunday morning? Are you praying about them? Worship team and musicians, have you really spent time in prayer this week as you lead us to the throne of grace and song? If you sing special songs in this church, are you really praying about the songs that you're going to sing? If you work with youth in this church, are you praying about the teens and the young adults that you're volunteering to work with? What if we all started to pray like we know that we should? It's the only you can answer that question this morning. I can't answer it for you. You can't answer it for me. And there's no judgment and there's no condemnation and there's no heaping on and saying, I'm even worse than I thought I was before I got there this morning. No, none of that. It's just saying, let's take an honest look at ourselves. Let's see ourselves as God sees us and say, yes, I need to make some adjustments. I need to make some changes. I need to get back on track in this area of prayer in my life and make the changes that are necessary. Only you know the truth. Only I know the truth. But imagine what would happen if we would really begin to pray. So this morning, maybe this is a new beginning for you in your life. This is a day you commit yourself to start praying more than you've been praying. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. There's no amount of time. And there's no right words to say and no wrong words to say. I often say it this way. Just talk to God like you're talking to your friend. Because the word tells us that I am a friend of God. I talk to God like I talk to my friends. My friends know when I'm happy and they know when I'm sad. They know when I'm angry and they know when I'm glad. They know when I'm disappointed and they know when I'm discouraged. My friends know everything about me. Why? Because I don't mind talking to them about it. I'm telling them how I feel. And God says, I'm your friend. Talk to me. Tell me. Let me know what's going on in your life. I'm going to ask you to do this with me this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything like that because to me this is a personal prayer that you need to pray and I need to pray. It is a prayer where we simply examine ourselves and see how we're doing in the area of prayer. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Remember there's no power in that. I don't want you to be distracted. Let me say this. The greatest prayer you'll ever pray is a prayer to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. That's the ultimate prayer. And if you're here or you're watching us online this morning and you have not yet prayed that prayer, or it has been a long time since you prayed that prayer, you just want to rededicate yourself to Christ today, just pray a simple prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I ask you to take away my sins. I ask you to help me live for you from this day forward. And tell him like you would tell your friend, I don't understand it all right now, but I'm going to do the best I can to live for you. That's a very simple prayer. If you prayed that prayer online, you make a note and tell the person monitoring them that you made that commitment. If you made that commitment here, you come and tell me, Pastor Atkins, I made that commitment today in church. And now, Father, I pray for this congregation. I pray your blessing upon them. I thank you for their willingness to give to those who are in need to support the, the tragedy that we shared this morning. I thank you for their willingness to worship you freely today. God, help us all to search our hearts and our lives to see how we are doing when it comes to our prayer time. For that one who's not praying as much as they'd like to, Lord, just begin to speak to their hearts today. For that one who's been distracted during their prayers, Lord, just help them to to put those distractions away. 
and let us have those conversations with you. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit recover us in our prayer time and you'd begin to lead us and guide us to pray for certain people or certain needs or, or certain things that are going on. Lord, you would just lead us and we will follow your leading as we pray those prayers. Lord, help us understand we'll never outgrow the need for prayer. Somebody we know today needs prayer right now. Somebody in our family needs prayer right now. One of our friends needs prayer right now. Somebody's child needs prayer right now. There's a coworker that needs prayer right now. Somebody's got a neighbor, and that neighbor needs prayer right now. God, inspire us and urge us and lead us to pray in those moments. We love you, Lord, today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everything that's been accomplished in our time together. We pray your blessing upon this congregation, those watching us, in Jesus' name. The church says together, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hey, all of you stay for the prayer today. Amen. God bless you. Hey, shake somebody's hand, hug a neck, tell them that you're glad to see them. Thank you, Harvest Ministers. We love you.